Hello everyone, uh, I'm late but I'm here. Okay, welcome to the computer science uh, lesson. Uh, my name is Watson Chanaka, I will be hosting you. I will be your teacher as usual. We're going to talk about the evolution of computers. We didn't talk much about the evolution of computers, but today we have got to get deep down. We have to understand exactly what we, where we came from until today. So we're in our computer science lesson. Today we're going to focus on evolution of computers. So the main objective of this lesson, we have to know or want to know the history of computers from the very first type of computer to the actual computer we have the the most recent computers we have nowadays in the year 2020 and uh, beyond so that is that is our main objective we're, we're going to look at the evolution from one generation to the other generation so okay let's start off um, unfortunately i cannot get your answers but i wanted to ask what a computer is what do you understand by the term computer so a computer is just a device which is used to process some information keep some information electronically just to help uh, people to do certain tasks that's one of the definitions there are various types of uh, de definitions but you will find out that today this computer we are talking about nowadays or the definition i gave back in the 1940s it wasn't that computer we have today but we will go we will get deep down into that then we all i also have another question uh, what was the main motive of inventing a computer the main motive of um, inventing a computer it was for manufacturing uh what we call the um, the guns we're talking about the bullets and we're talking about the bombs okay this was created in the united states of america in the military base uh, and what they wanted to use a computer for was for calculating they wanted to calculate for example if an explosive let me get a, a what you call this a pen uh, where is a pointer i've got a pen here let me take let me choose the red color where is the pointer okay ink sorry for that okay the united states of america for example they've got their enemy on this line and they are here so they wanted to have for example to manufacture a gun or bullets which could travel for example for this distance if the enemy is for example is two kilometers away what type of gun should they use what kind of a bullet should they use if it is a bomb if it is going to explode for example in this area how much area is it going to destroy so all this what they wanted calculations would all wanted calculations so what they did they created what we call a computer but before the computer they used what we call a calculator but then there were complex calculations which a normal calculator couldn't do so they decided to create what we call a computer okay let's move on to the generation of valves so the first computer which was created uh, it was called ENIAC ENIAC is an abbreviation which means electronic numerical integrator and calculator which means that it was a machine an electronic machine with numerical integration and a calculator so it means on that electronic machine they mounted a calculator which was the main purpose of creating that computer for calculations so this was created in the military base in the united states of america only for manufacturing those arms of war so we're talking about the bullets we're talking about the guns we're talking about all those ammunitions so it was mainly for creating ammunition for the war and we're talking about the second world war the first world war second world war they were preparing for the fight so it was the first computer to use digital electronic data at a large scale so it means there were other uh, what do you call them uh, calculators but those calculators were not exactly electronic but now we have a word which is called digital when you're talking about digital data we're talking of zeros and ones which are called binary digit so any computer there is no computer which understands text for example like this it only understands zeros and ones which you call binary 
data. So this was the first computer to use what we call binary data, which are zeros and ones. That's why we use the word digital. We also have what we call analog data. Analog data, these are everyday languages or text we are using. For example, the text you can see here, this is analog data. We have sound waves, it's also part of analog data. So looking at these data analog, they cannot be or they can hardly be processed or they could be hardly be processed by the NIA computer back in the days. But nowadays, we speak the analog language that computers they capture the analog data and they convert it to digital data so we'll talk about that later in the chapter of binary conversion then the NIA computer was able to calculate 5000 additions so it means when somebody was uh, wanted to make some calculations for example additions it could make 5000 additions per second and it was also now able to calculate 360 multiplications per second that was fast comparing to what to a calculator which was a handheld calculator but nowadays if you use a computer which calculates for example 5000 editions per, per second it will be very very slow 3600 sorry 360 multiplications per second it could be very very slow but back in the days it was very fast because they were migrating from a handheld calculator to an electronic digital computer Okay, so inside the computer or inside the computer ENIAC, they mounted what we call the valves. What was the function of a valve? The function of a valve was to transmit data from point A to point B. For example, they want to, they are on point A, we've got point B here. So they are processing data. So what they did, they mounted these valves along the line, which is going to transmit the data. So it means the function of a valve was to transmit data from one point to the other that was one function of it then it also had a function of uh what you call this amplifying data it means you turn it uh, sorry the valve used to transmit and amplify the data so that it doesn't lose the speed it doesn't lose the pace it doesn't lose whatever is being carried or being transmitted by by the computer so they had to it had to amplify because of the distance we we'll talk about the distance or the size of the computer it was very big so at times okay we're talking about the data transmission over three meters over five meters over six meters that was very long so if they don't amplify that data it means they could lose the data so the function of a valve was to transmit and amplify data so this valve if you look at it it looks like oh, the technology which used the valve it used the very same technology technology with um, those light bulbs we have at home the ones which waste a lot of energy or a lot of electricity these ones which you've got a tungsten inside here okay we're talking about these ones these ones they had the same technology so once they connected this valve it could light here so that it could transmit and amplify the data okay characteristics of uh, ENEC we want to see how exactly was the computer ENEC built it was totally electronic which means it was digital we have said digital it means it's any data which is zero or one computers they don't understand letters a to z they don't understand numbers zero to nine but they only understand zeros and ones which is called binary data so it was totally electronic so it means it only understood zeros and ones zeros and ones zero 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 one 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 it was a combination of zeros and ones so it was not uh, to be used by anyone not any other person beside the technicians only the technicians could use the computer so by then they didn't use the word technician they used the word uh, scientist so it means those scientists by then it was very popular to have scientists than techni technicians so those scientists they were the ones who were who, who could only operate the computer so okay we'll talk about the scientists later then inside that computer the it was mounted 17468 valves which were mounted inside the computer what was the function of the valves to transmit data and to amplify data from one point to the other 
So you see inside them there were 17,468 valves which could be lit at the same time and we'll talk about the disadvantage of lighting those 17,000 valves. Then uh, the, the weight of the computer was 30, 30 tons of weight. So it means they couldn't, uh, it, was not, it was not mobile. First you had to construct, as you can see, we've got 1,800 meters, sorry, square meters of the area of construction. And the height of the computer was 5,5 meters in height and 25 meters in length. So it was a very, very big computer. We'll talk about these characteristics later. We're going to add on. Why was it 25 meters? Why was it 5,5 meters? Why was it 1,800 square meters and 30 tons of weight? This is too much, but we'll later talk about that so that we could so that we can try to justify why they had all these characteristics. Okay, looking at the this picture here, we've got uh, the NA computer. We've got this guy here who's working inside the computer. A long time ago, it was opening the door. Get inside the computer, you start working. You get to a table, you sit, you start working inside the computer. Nowadays, what are we doing? The computer is actually inside our pockets. It's actually on our glasses. We've got those smart glasses. They're now on the glasses. It's now inside our pocket. So it's technology. We're talking about the evolution. We're coming where we're coming from and where we're going. That is the objective of this lesson. So a long time ago, it was opening the door. Then you start working inside the computer. So this was a part of the computer, just a part of the computer. Okay, let's go to the next one. As you can see, we've got this guy here. He's sitting inside the computer. He's got his desk. He's working inside the computer. And we've got this lady here. She's working on her area. What they did, these scientists here, they had to work on a shift basis. The computer worked 24 hours a day, and they worked on shifts. Some get in the morning, afternoon, others they go overnight. The computer had to run 24 hours so that they could process whatever they were processing. So if you look at the size here, we've got the cables here, we've got the valves, these are the valves which are mounted along the, the computer. As you can see here, these are the valves which were mounted on the computer. Okay, the valves, let me go back a bit. Okay, uh, if you look at these valves, the function of the valves, as we said, we said the valve it has got a function or it sorry it had a function of transmitting data from point a to point b that was the main function but what happened now with the valves for example this is the line of communication what happened now with the valves if one valves get one valve sorry get bent it means there is no longer data sorry there is no longer continuation here there is no more continuation because the one valve it's bent. So there comes this lady now. What's her job? Is to check to see if there is any valve which is not lit. It means it's bent. She's, she has to substitute it, put another valve here so that data can be transmitted. So somebody who's just at the end here, who just shout, I haven't received any information. Then these guys who are in the middle, each person has got a section, is going to look. If there are any valves which are bent so that they can substitute so that was very tiresome and it's at times it could drag the processing of the computer to be very very slow because if you are trying to work with the target now for example by 10 o'clock we should be done by uh, we should be done with certain calculations but then if the valves just continue burning and if the scientists or the technicians take long to identify the bent uh, valves it means that that's going to slow down the data processing so they try to invent this machine now this machine was meant to identify as you can see here it's, it's off there's a light here it's dim it's, it's bright and it's actually off here so it helped on each line for example they knew that on this line here on these lines here it's off one of the valves is bent so there's no communication or the line is a little bit weak something is wrong with the line or it's on it's very good there's very good communication on that line so this switchboard here helped them to identify the lines which are 
on communication and the lines which are off communication. This is another part of the computer. As we can see, these are the valves here which are mounted on the computer. And here we've got uh, these women. They said uh, during the, that time in the 1940s, only women could work inside the computer. They wanted more women than men. Why? Women, they, were pa they are patient. Just look at a baby. You get the baby, she's going to mess up a, a nappies. You clean her. In less than two minutes, she messes again the nappies. You have to clean. So women are very patient on that note. If you look at the men, we cannot do that. So that happens. That what that is exactly what happened with these valves. You try to change this valve, for example, it's bent. You change it. But all of a sudden, this one bends again. You go to this one. The next one here, or the very same you are changing, is going to bend again. So it needed a lot of patience for somebody who just working around substituting valves along the computer at any point of time. So usually they used women to work inside the computer. But they were not ordinary women. This was time of war. We were talking about the Second World War. And these were actually military women. So they worked with orders. So they had to be there. They had to, they had to substitute those valves check on every part so as you can see there are three women here and there are more uh, so each person for example this one worked until here this one worked until here so this is a part and this is a part and this is a part so we, they had to control this these equipment or these valves substituting the the valve so that the data can be processed without any problems Okay, this is another part of the computer. As you can see, we've got the valves. I think here they are a bit visible. We've got the valves which are here. These are the valves. All these are the valves. They look like bulbs. And these are the cables. Cables, they say that if you join these cables, one cable could reach around 5 kilometers, but just around this computer. Imagine a rat getting inside this computer, eating one of the, or cutting one of the cables there. It was very, very difficult to identify the problem because the computer was very, very big. So this is one part uh, of the corridor or one part of the computer. We also have this guy here, as you can see, replacing a bed tube meant checking among the ENIAC 19,000 possibilities. So it means, okay, uh, one of the things which I forgot to say, History at times it doesn't give exact information. Some of the information may be distorted or they may not get the real exactly. Uh, if you check on my slide here, I said uh, in at the beginning, the computer ENAC had 1,000, sorry, it, was, it had 17,360 valves inside it. But as you can see on this other source here, sorry, I forgot to put the site where I took this image. I should put that for copyrights. But it's saying it's 19,000 valves, possibilities. So it means it was more than 19,000 valves which were inside the computer. Okay, but that's not a fact. So we can say just 17 to 20,000 valves which were mounted inside the computer ENIAC. Okay, so as you can see, this uh, guy here has got a... His section is going to be controlling these valves. If any of these valves gets bent... It was very possible, for example, burning this one, burning this one, burning this one, burning this one. Then you have to substitute. As you can see, it's got a reserve tank here. So it means it's taking the valves here, it's going to substitute on the wall. So per day, they could count around 4,000 to 6,000 valves, which got burned. So it was now business. Another... Um, what you call this, uh, these trucks, they're carrying new valves to the computer. And we've got another truck carrying those bent valves to go and throw them away. So it was very, very expensive. But this was government money. It was during the World War. So it was actually who pays more or who suffers. It is the civilians who pay the tax. Okay, they reached to a point where the calculations were working. And the computer was now gaining speed. And they could not cope up with the speed of the computer. Because what happened in the, at the beginning, they calculated 1 plus 1, they write 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. Then they add uh, 6 plus 9, 
It's another result. Ten plus ten, another result. They are writing by hand. But then the computer was much faster than a human. So they decided, how can we store the data now? We can't cope up with the speed of the computer. We may lose some of the important calculations made. So they designed what we call a punched card. A punched card, we had to use a punched card reader. So it means that, okay, if I calculate 1 plus 1 is 2, then I had to put the result on the punched card reader. Then it was going to make a hole like this one. As you can see here, yeah, this is the hole we're talking about. We've got another one here. These white ones here, these are the holes we're talking about. So each hole, it could represent either a digit from 0 to 9, and when we talk about digits 0 to 9 in computers, it means this number 22 is inside, sorry, it's between 0 and 9. We're talking about the number 99. We're talking about the number 2000. In computers, we don't count, for example, this is 220. We don't count it as 220. We count it as 220. So it's a digit. So it's between 0 and 9. You can pick up a number, for example, 913. In computers, we don't read it as 913, but we read it as a digit, 913. So it's between 0 and 9. So that hole or that punched part of, a, of the card, it could represent a number, or it could represent letters from A to Z, or it could represent special characters. We're talking about the end sign. We're talking about the hashtag. So the hash sign, we're talking about the dollar sign, we're talking about the comma, the percentage sign, we're talking about the star, all these are the symbols we are referring. So these are special characters. So it could not support, for example, in Portuguese, it could not support these letters. We'll talk about them later. This was now, this is what we call Unicode, and so this was not Unicode, so we'll talk about this later. It was not supported by then. It, all, it could only support 0 to 9, A to Z, and the symbols. So this was the punched card. As you can see, punching positions in a card. So this was the punched card. Okay, so this worked a lot. They started storing data, but it was a problem. Was at the end of the day, they could have uh, a lot of these papers or these punched cards. And whenever they wanted to read the information which is on the punched card, they had to put it back on the punched card reader this one so it was kind of a work then they had a monitor which could help them to read that information so it was not easy but it was much better than writing by hand okay the computer or any it worked perfectly not exactly as the word perfect okay i use the word perfect because i'm comparing to a handheld calculator so it was perfect by then because there was nothing else to compare with it with so it was good just imagine you've got your whatever you think is best. If it is the best in the market and there's no other thing which is better than that, then you have the best. That was the thing which happened with the uh, ENIAC computer. Okay, it worked a lot and uh, it really helped. And uh, according to history, uh, those who know their history, uh, United States of America, they started to win in the World War II. Why? Because whatever they were doing, it was calculated. The types of ammunition they were going to carry, it was well calculated. What type of bombs should we carry? How far or what is the distance with uh, the enemy, with the enemy line? So they had to know, okay, we're going to carry this type of arms. They're going to help us kill those guys. So everything they were doing was much calculated than other, other guys there. So they started to win. Then they reached to a time now, okay, they said, okay, okay, we are winning in the world war, but we are not doing anything productive. They said to anyone or any company, those who want to use a computer for production, you can mount your own computer, that is okay. We can help you with the, with the scientists who, have, who now know how to operate the computer, they can help you. So if you look at the research centers, they started to use it. Uh, what you call this MET department, they started to use it. So, but it was only big organizations who could use this. As you can see, the cost were very, very high. Let's talk about the problems of the computer ENEC. One of the main problems of the computer ENEC was overheating. 
as you can see over 600 sorry over 65 degrees celsius imagine if the outside temperature is just 40 degrees we are just crying but these guys or these militaries they had to work inside the 65 degrees celsius but then the computer could freeze it could no longer work so what they did they had to stop switch off the computer leave it to cool down once it's cooled down they had to restart again the computer so that they can continue working as we said that the computer worked 24 hours a day so it could overheat easily but besides being working uh, 24 hours the valves which were inside that computer those which could overheat we're talking about 17 to 19,000 valves which are lit at the same time and we're talking about the valve sorry about the light bulb at home which is like this and we all know these in terms of summer for example they create a lot of heat they're good in winter it, it, uh, they make uh, your house a little bit warm but they produce a lot of heat imagine 19,000 valves lit inside the room that's why the computer reached this temperature of 65 degrees celsius so they had to switch off the computer let it cool then they had to start again so that slowed again production then a high energy consumption the consumption of electricity it was very very high why even at home these type of light bulbs they consume more than the led lights everyone now is going is moving on to led lights which are very very cheap as compared to these these uh, to these ones which or which have got a tungsten here they produce a lot of heat and they consume a lot of electricity so the electricity consumption was very high they say that around that uh, area which was mounted the the ENIAC, when they started the computer ENIAC, other households there other neighbors in that area they could not have electricity so that's when they created what we call a pt a transmission uh what do you call a pt that thing uh, a small house which is uh, separates electricity in an area each area has got a pt uh, in portuguese they call it a postal transmission which is a transmission uh, whatever but that thing they created you know, it so that they could separate uh, the electricity from the military base and the households or the neighbors which are around so the invention of the NA computer it helped a lot to invent other things we're talking about this uh, transmission post yes i think it's transmission post they, they started to create to separate nowadays each and every neighborhood has got its own transmission post which is used to separate current and that's why you see for example uh if it is tambara doge we have, we have electricity swap they don't have electricity it's because of this transmission proto uh, sorry uh, transmission post they can they are used to separate current then on, uh, we have another point uh, relatively slow why the word are relatively slow so it means it's coming up from the word fast but then it got a little bit slow yes we use the word relatively slow because we are comparing to a handheld calculator so with the any computer it was much faster so if we check on the data transmission it went slow or it went relatively slow when a valve gets bent so it means the transmission of data is going to stop until that valve is substituted so that's where it goes to relatively slow okay the computer is overheating it's around 65 degrees they had to switch off the computer half a day so that it could do it could cool down so that's where it takes the word relatively slow but otherwise if everything was okay it was very very fast to process as compared to a handheld machine then we have uh, the other point is too big the computer was just too big we're talking about 25 meters of length of a computer and we are talking about for example i gave an example of about five kilometers of cable which is inside the computer we're talking about 19,000, 17 to 19,000 valves which are inside the computer that is not easy to manage okay on that 25 meters 
if anything goes wrong, how are you going to identify? I gave an example of a red just cutting one of the cables. How long are they going to take or how long would they take to identify that cable? So it was very, very big, too big for management. Anything which is too big is very difficult to manage. Small, but very easy to manage. Okay, the other point was very expensive. It was very, very expensive operating the computer, managing the computer. And we're talking about electric sorry, we're talking about technicians who are qualified to manage the computer. So it means from the salaries, they're very, very high. And they worked in shifts. We're not talking about ordinary men who are going to come and sweep. Okay, there were those sweepers. But then we also had technicians who had to monitor every operation inside that computer. So it was very, very expensive. But it was government money. So the taxpayer suffers, but very, very expensive. We're talking about four to 6,000 valves which were substituted a day. A week, how many? Just two humans. So it is very, very expensive. Electricity, very, very expensive. 19,000 lit valves, very, very expensive. The consumption was very, very high. So we have another point. It takes us to another point, which is complications in changing from one program to another. When you talk about the complications, what complications or difficulties do they have on changing from one computer to another? Nowadays, if you look at any program, we've got an X button here for closing. Okay, I don't want this slide again. Tap. When I click, I'm closing. Back in the days, with the computer ENIAC, it was not possible just closing. First, you had to switch off the computer, change the cables, reconnect, and start again the computer. So that was very time consuming. And after switching on the computer, it could not start. It was very possible that the computer could not start. If somebody makes a mistake, then they couldn't start the computer. So that took a long time to reconnect or rewire the computer. They took half a day to a day trying to change from one com sorry trying to change from one program to another program but nowadays just say a click we're just another program so what they do what they what they, what they did sorry they started to work in a, what we call batch processing batch processing it means that sorry my handwriting will be bad i'm writing with the mouse i'm not used to uh, writing uh, with the mouse okay but batch processing is what we call processing in as a as a batch so it means for example if they are doing additions they will do all the additions they keep the result okay let's do subtraction next the switch of the computer they change the cable they reconnect okay the computer is working let's do subtraction they are done let's switch off the computer reconnect let's do multiplication it's done Let's do division. So this is what we call working in batch processing. Batch processing. At the end of the day, they could combine the result of addition, the result of subtraction, the result of multiplication, the result of division to come up with one result at the end of the day so that they could they they didn't switch off the computer at any time okay i'm done with addition let's do subtraction then now i forgot to do calculations they go back again that could waste a lot of time so they started to work in what we call batch processing so basically this is uh these are the problems which uh, were created by the computer ENIAC, although it really helped a lot not only in the manufacturing of uh, guns and ammunition but it also started to work for research being productive any questions on the first generation okay let's move on to the second generation which is the generation of uh, transistors 1950 to 1950 so 1952 to 1964 Okay, in 1952, Bell Laboratories, they invented what we call the transistor. So if you look at the transistor, it had the same function with the valve. What is the function of a transistor? 
it was meant to transmit data from one point to another and to amplify data from one point to the other so that it doesn't lose or doesn't drop any carried data along the transmission line. So that was the function of a transistor. They only substituted the valve, but it carried the same function, which then uh, became one of the main components of the construction of computers and electronic devices. It substituted the valves. So with this, this is one of the transistor. So it means it substituted being it. Sorry, it came. Uh, they dropped the, that technology of a bulb to this kind of technology, which was something integrated, and it was exactly as this one. Nowadays, if you check in any electronic device, we now have a lot of these transistors which are mounted inside the the any inside any electronic device with the help of transmitting data and amplifying the data along the device. If you look at this image, the size of the computer which used a valve, it reduced. Sorry, which used a transistor, it reduced its size. Why? Valves. Okay, I'll explain that part later. Let's look at the advantages of using a transistor. Normal heating. Why? A valve could overheat because of the technology which was used to mount, to make a valve, just like a loud bulb. Then we are talking about 17 to 19,000 valves which are lit at the same time. So it means it created what we call a lot of heat. But now with a transistor, the heating is normal just like any device. It's working, but it's heating just normally. So it reduced that kind of temperature. So they stopped working in shifts. They could work on the eight, normal eight hours per day. Then the low consumption of electricity, there was low consumption of electri electricity because a transistor now, it used little energy than a valve. Could bank trust on the transmission? Okay, this is just an expression. Uh, banking, it means you are giving trust to somebody. With a valve now, it was very difficult. Okay, I want to send data from point A to point B. It was very difficult to trust if this data is going to reach, for example, in, uh, is going to reach within five seconds, for example. Very difficult to trust it. Or even within a minute, it could take more. So, okay, I'm sending you data, but I don't know if it is going to reach you there. So it was very difficult to bank trust on them. But now with the transistor, it was, it was now possible to give all your trust to that data transmission i'm sending you data and you know it's going to get there because the valve so the transistor is not going to bend so it was worth trusting that increased the speed we come to this point it, it increased the speed of data transmission because there was no more bending of valves it's now a transistor the size of the computer automatically reduced the computer any computer was very very big 25 meters long 5.5 meters in height why they were trying to spread or to make the room very big so that the heating won't be too much imagine in a small room all that heating nobody could work inside so they decided to make a very very big room so that it, it couldn't be very very hot inside and talking about the computer ENIAC, they created what we call a fan, but it didn't work. It was just um, blowing hot air. They invented what we call an AC, air conditioner, but still, it didn't work. It could still overheat. So if you look at the computer ENIAC, it, only, it didn't only work on the IT part. It also helped to invent other gadgets. But since we are in computer science, we are talking about computers, let's stick to our computers. Then uh, it could ex execute, sorry, it could execute billions of instructions per second. I'm very sorry for my English. Uh, I was now used to speak a lot of Portuguese here, so I'm trying to cope up, but I think I will pick up. It could execute billions of instructions per second. 
So if you look at the computer ENIAC, which used valves, it calculated, for example, 500, uh, so 360 multiplications per second. But now we are now talking about billions of instructions per second. So it means it was now very, very fast in processing. The price of the computer got lower. Yes, we said uh, the United States, after they were, uh, after they were winning uh, in the World War II, they decided to stop manufacturing uh, computer. Sorry, they started to stop manufacturing these guns. They reduced. They didn't stop exactly. They reduced, but they give they gave liberty to any other company which wanted to produce, especially in the manufacturing industry, to use the computer. So the prices they started to go to get lower because the size of the computer, the number of workers who are going to be who were going to be working inside the computer. So that was going to be that was that came up as a good punch to help reduce the the price of the computer. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the disadvantages. You can research on the disadvantages of using a transistor. But before we talk about the third generation of the computers, let's look at now, let's look at the objectives of the scientist. What is the objective of the scientist? The main objectives of the scientist was to, one, reduce Okay, I don't know. Okay, let me let me use a word document. I think it will be much faster. Let me use a word document. I can't even open my word document. My computer. I don't know what's happening with it. Okay, just a minute. Okay, since I don't have a, what do you call this, a board, I'm going to be using this one. Okay, so what, are the, what were the objectives of the technicians? One of the main objectives of the technicians was to reduce, reduce the size of the computer. That was the main objective of the scientists, to reduce the size of the computer. Number two increase the speed of processing number three take the computer home number four they wanted to improve the storage Uh, sorry, the storage of a computer. Okay, we didn't talk about the storage of the second generation. We'll go back to that. And the last point was to, I'm forgetting, reduce the size of the computer, increase the speed of processing, take the computer home, improve the storage of, the, of a computer. And the last one was to substitute. Substitute, substitute the technician okay what it means now with these points here these from the first generation which was the ENIAC to the second generation as you can see they are trying to reduce the size of the computer and they are improving the computer what what were the objectives of the scientists now as from the second generation to reduce the size of the computer they want something which is small and manageable even the second generation, the computer was still very small. Uh, so it's still very big. So they wanted a smaller computer. Increase the speed of processing. We're talking about executing billions of instructions per second. We're talking about increasing billions of instructions per second. So they didn't want this. They wanted more than billions of instructions per second. Take the computer home. First generation, second generation, no one could take the computer home. Why? Okay, let's look at our small yard. They are very small, small yards. 
we're talking about uh, for example here in Mozambique we're going we're talking about 25 meters by by 30 meters so that could be filled only with one computer where are we going to be living now so it was a great problem they had another objective improve the storage of the computer we talked about the punched card it had problems you should just get humidity oh sorry the cards get humid water dust tearing the one of the walls it could it couldn't read them the data so that was a disadvantage and it could store very little data on that punched card so at the end of the year for example at the end of the month or day they could have mountains and mountains of papers or punched cards so that was not very good for storage substitute the technician first generation second generation only technicians could work inside the computer so it means if you buy a computer you cannot use it you have to add uh, sorry you had to have a technician who was going to be operating the computer okay i'm the boss of the company so what i do i just tell the technicians i want a program which does this and that so the technician now knows where to touch the ones and zeros to mix them up and come up with a result so if you look at the management of uh, management of business a long time ago people were not worried about how it is done but they were worried about the result who was worried about how it's done were the technicians so these are the objectives of of the technicians okay so let's go to the third generation or oh, before we go to the third generation on this uh, second generation how did how did they store data they used what we call a magnetic disk i think i have to go back to to my board okay so on storage okay let's talk about the storage storage it means how they store their data so in the first generation they used the uh, punch the card the second generation they used what we call magnetic disks these were used to store data then we we'll talk about the third generation so uh, in the second generation they used both types of storage if anything goes wrong with the punched card they could refer to the magnetic disk if anything goes wrong with the magnetic disk they could refer to the punched card so this was they used both one as a backup if anything goes wrong what is the problem with the magnetic disk and how did it look like the magnetic disk was just like this okay something like this so it could roll over so information was kept on this disk here so the technology which was here it was metal but the technology which is here is the same technology which is used on a CD or a DVD. So it was very sensitive to dust, humidity, scratching. So it was very risky again to put information on that very same device. Okay, let's go on to the third generation, 1964 to 1971. It was called the generation of the integrated circuit. In 1958 to 1959, four scientists participated in the development of an integrated circuit when you talk about the integrated circuit it means they took those transistors and they had to put them on a board like this one for example they joined the transistors on an integrated circuit so when we use the word integrated it means they're going to be, they were integrating these transistors and other electronic components on one board so this is the circuit we're talking about so automatically this reduced the size of the computer is one of the objectives objectives of the scientists so with the integrated circuit in 1960 the ibm company it launched a computer called the ibm 360 sorry this was supposed to be which 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 was manufactured basing on the integrated sorry for the this which was manufactured based on the integrated circuit so it means it was now a microcomputer if you check now the name they were using is called microcomputer it means it's reduced it has reduced the size of the computer how by using the integrated circuit ibm 
This was the company which invented the calculator, that handheld calculator we're talking about. And they didn't take part in the manufacturing of the NIA computer. But later they liked the transistor, then they liked the integrated circuit. They decided to come up, come back to the manufacturing and they invented the IBM 360. IBM is an abbreviation. It means International Business Machine. So it's a company which worked with the business machines, especially for the commercial side like calculations, cal sorry, calculators. We're talking about the drawer, the two drawer in the shops there where they use calculators. And those are two machines they worked more with B IBM, which is International Business Machine. So these were well known as chips. So if you have read the word chips in the computer, it means anything which is very small. So this was a small component, but on this component, they were integrated a lot of things. Let's talk about the chips we eat. They're very small, but on those chips, this, this is a potato chip, for example. But there's vinegar, there's salt, there's other ingredients which are there to make it nice. So that was the very same technology which was used here. It was a, it was a, a small chip, but on that chip it was mounted one of the main components which is the transistor. Then there were other electronic components which were mounted on that chip. So the first uh, chip was this one, or the first uh, integrated circuit, it was this one. As you can see, Technology, it was, they were still trying to work up with the technology, but then they improved in 1971, the company Intel, it introduced this one. So as you can see, the chip is here. This is the chip part we are talking about. And this one is just about carrying this chip. And we've got this something like, uh, like legs. These are used to transmit data from this chip here with the transistors here. So data is going to be transmitted over these legs. So where, where is the data going? It will be going on a motherboard. For example, it's a computer. So they're going to be plugged inside the motherboard. So they're going to be transmitting data to other components of the computer. So these were very, very important. In 1974, Intel also worked on another chip. As you can see, they are trying to reduce the size. In 1975, another company, it worked most tech. It also went into the production and they created what we call the chips. Okay, looking at uh, our history, if you are just uh, with me, we are actually talking about the hardware. What is missing now? It's missing the program. One of the objectives of the scientist was to substitute what? The technicians. They wanted an ordinary person to use a computer, not to hire a computer. When you buy a computer, you have to hire a technician to work for you. No, 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 no. That was not the objective of the scientist. They had an objective of substituting a technician and let an ordinary user use a computer. So in 1975, William Bill Gates and Paul Allen, they created the first software for microcomputers known as BASIC. So that was missing. What is the function of software? We have two types of software. One, we have soft, sorry, system software. System software is the software which is used to help any machine to work. If it is a computer, you just press on the button. Then what is going to make the computer work? It's the software. It's going to start the fans. It's going to start working, loading the operating system, and it takes you, for example, to the desktop. If it is your phone, just press on the on button. That system we call Android is going to start everything for you until it gets your password or until it gets to the screen where you can start working. So that is what we call software system. Then we have application software. Application software is the software which helps the user to do a certain task. I want to write text, I'll go to Microsoft Word. I want to do calculations, I'll go to Microsoft Excel. I want to remove viruses from my computer, I'll use an antivirus. So this is what we call application software. It helps the user to do a certain task. Okay, we'll talk about software in later chapters. So if you check now, in 1975, Bill Gates was a student and Paul Allen also was a student at a university. And they created the first program known as BASIC. BASIC is just a, a programming language 
which is used to design other applications like these ones we're talking about or design other operating systems like windows we're talking about now we have windows 10 we are talking about uh, any linux operating systems we're talking about apple operating systems mac operating systems and we're also talking about the android operating system so these are designed with such programs like basic beginners or purpose symbolic instruction code although they are now beta languages we'll talk here about the computer programming languages later but this was the first programming language which they used to design the program so later in the year bill gates and paul allen they founded the company microsoft one of the best companies in the computer or in the micro computer industry so they designed the program so almost everyone when we learn computers we're going to be learning microsoft applications but we also have other companies like apple we also have other companies like linux sun microsystems we're going to talk about those companies but some of them they are not popular i will explain why they are not popular rather than microsoft okay so bill gates and paul allen they managed paul allen okay is dead but bill gates is still alive although i don't think he's doing anything nowadays just eating his money but now okay they they manage the objective just press a button any device is going to be working now with your software so in the year 1977 three microcomputers were launched in series they like the combination of hardware and software hardware those are the physical components of a computer like we're talking about the NEC, we're talking about the valves, we're talking about the cables, we're talking about the keyboard, we're talking about the monitor. Those are the physical components of a computer. Then in 1975, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, they created software, which are programs, which are going to make a combination now of the software and the hardware. And now we're going to have a working device. When you press a button on a computer, you're pressing on a hardware. What is it going to do? It's going to start the hardware like fans, like the hard disk, and it's going to load now these programs, the operating system, which you are going to be using for typing. Or you're going to, if it is WhatsApp, for example, you're going to be texting each other. You're now using the software. Okay, so in 1977, they liked that combination. Or well, before I go to that combination, it meant that if any computer manufacturer is in hardware, they had to get in contact with the software manufacturers so that they could design something which works. Okay, design a program which is going to work with this, 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 this. Or they would say, design a hardware which can work like this, this, this. So they had to work together. Nowadays, they are working together. Microsoft companies, they work with hardware companies so that they design something which is very nice or which works together. So in 1977, Three companies, they enjoyed that combination of hardware and software. And one of them was Apple. Uh, Apple is still in the market. Those are the ones with uh, the Macintosh computers or the Mac computers. Then we also have the TRS-80 of Radio Shack. Radio Shack was a company which produced uh, radios. Of com uh, radios. They entered the market in the second generation when they created what we call the... What do you call these ones? The transistor. They used the transistor. They enjoyed it and they started manufacturing radios. So in 1977, they also liked the combination of hardware and software. They entered into the market, but they didn't last. PET also entered the market, but they didn't last. But Apple, one of the best computers in the world, they are still around. We'll talk about the types of computers later. So in 1979, Software Arts, Software Arts was one of the companies, or it was a sub-company of Microsoft it launched the first program which was called VisiCalc. VisiCalc it was a, the first commercial program on microcomputers. So it means it was used on companies. VisiCalc nowadays is called Microsoft Excel. They only changed the name and they only added very new functions which is much better than the VisiCalc. So they used in companies for stock control, uh, salary calculations, uh inventory and a lot of calculations in any organization so it was very popular and nowadays it's still very very popular and very very important to anyone who wants to work or do some calculations inside their computer 
questions about the third generation okay on storage of devices how do they store data okay we're here they continued using the magnetic disk and some of them they still use the punched card but they also invented what we call a yeah, magnetic tape it was one of the main devices they used to store data on a tape so magnetic tape where am i magnetic tape it means that for example it was a cassette for all those for you for those who have seen a cassette but this generation i don't think you know a cassette but we used a cassette a long time ago okay it was like this a cassette so it means there was a tape here it could roll from one side to the other storing data and it could be read here on this part there was a device which could read data on the read or write data on the tape but it also had problems if anything goes wrong for example it breaks okay what did we do for example if it was a music cassette or a, a video cassette we could take it open it we could seal it here with cello tape but what happened to this part now it means you lose data it comes to this part it skips okay it's music okay you lose a couple of words if it is a video you, could, you lose a couple of or a couple of uh, event here but then if it is data you lose a lot of data we're talking about data which is meaningful you're going to lose it and it's going to be meaningless now the rest which is going to follow because you have lost some part of data so this was one of the great disadvantages of using a magnetic tape also it was very sensitive to, sensitive to dust sunlight humidity you can name them so uh what did companies do they used two types of storage either a magnetic tap and they have another copy on magnetic disk if anything goes wrong with the magnetic disk they have a copy here. if anything goes wrong with this they have a copy here. so this is how they started to work so that they don't lose data during the operations okay moving on to the fourth generation of computers the 1971 to 1981 the generation of micro processor okay the l sorry the ic lsi integrated circuit large scale integration was developed improving the improving from the integrated circuit so what they did they took that small integrated circuit and they even reduced it further that's why they do that's what they did that's why they're using the name integrated circuit large scale integration those transistors they were still here mounted here they reduced the size of the transistors they also mounted other components here integrating those components so that they could have a very small component let's go back to our, to the objectives of the scientists yeah reduce the size of the computer they are managing so they are reducing for example the, from the integrated circuit to the integrated circuit at large scale they are reducing the size they want to increase the speed of processing they want to take the computer home improve the storage of the computer and substitute the technician at this juncture here they have managed to substitute the technician in 1975 when they introduced the software they haven't managed totally but they are moving into the section we'll get to that later okay let's continue they added more components on the circuit like i was saying then the most famous ones the most famous chips were motorola so they gave them the name super chips because these ones were chips but they reduced them and they gave them the name super chip so the most famous at that time were motorola 68000 was one of the chips motorola went into the market creating those uh, communication radios like the ones which use the security allow over over there can you read me then they press button they entered into the market because they liked the uh, transistor they invented this then also you have another on a hewlett packard they also invented they're still in the market this one they just processed um, for a couple of uh, devices then they moved out 
they moved back to the manufacturing of the radio or of the communication radios then we have Hewlett and Packard Hewlett and Packard they're still in the market those are the computers we call the HP Hewlett and Packard they're still around manufacturing now both the hardware and the software so this is an example of a of a microprocessor as you can see the components are integrated here and as you can see these pins here each pin has got a function of transmitting certain data to the motherboard if you break for example you break this pin here it means that this whole thing you cannot use it anymore you have to throw it away because it is going to miss some of the communication data which was supposed to be sent by this broken down pin so it's very very sensitive if you open it please don't touch anything if you don't have any knowledge of these devices some of the processors nowadays they're just flat they don't have anything there just flat here but now on the motherboard it still has these pins so it means if anything goes wrong it's now much uh, much dangerous on a computer because if anything goes on the motherboard you're going to throw away the motherboard so it was much better you throw out this you throw away the the processor then you get another another processor now you have to throw the motherboard then you get another then you can put this so it's much sensitive please don't open your computer if you don't have the technical knowledge so in 1981 that company international business machine company they came back to the production of computers they liked the processor and they invented the ibm pc so ibm pc pc it means personal computer let's look at the objective of the scientists they had the objectives of taking the computer at home let's look here they reduced the size of the computer they managed 1981 increased the speed of processing they managed in 19 1981 take the computer at home the computer reached at home in 1981 improved the storage of the computer computers now in 1981 they started to store data inside the computer not outside as you can see this storage we're talking about here is outside the computer but in 1981 now on the fourth generation they started to use what we call the hard disk so it means they started to store data inside the computer then also on the fourth generation they invented what we call the diskette if i'm not mistaken this is yes this is the spelling of diskette this one they stored data outside the computer so this was external outside the computer this was inside this one was inside storage okay the rest this was outside 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 so they stored data outside the computer these ones so if somebody steals or they lose that data it's all gone but in 1981 now data was stored inside the computer okay let's go back to our slide here so that i can explain as you can see so the first computer it didn't have a mouse some may think it was missing a mouse it didn't have a mouse here it used the operating system called ms dos ms dos these are commands which are abbreviated like for example if you want to say copy they use the command cp so it was very difficult to use but at least you didn't need a technician to be around you so that it could work anyone just go to school learn how to use it even when they were selling this computer they used to sell with a manual with all the commands of how to use the computer storage was here now inside there there was a what you call a hard disk what is the function of a hard disk is to store data but besides storing data the first thing it stores it stores what you call the operating system nowadays we have windows 10 switch on the button you're going to see here windows 10 so it means that is the operating system where is it it's stored inside the hard disk so it's going to load all the programs okay i want to open microsoft word in my computer where is it stored it's stored where in the hard disk so the hard disk it stores all the programs which the user needs to use 
Then we also have external here on this component here. There was a disk drive, sorry, a diskette drive where we could uh, diskette. It was an external device which we used to store data here externally. So it means you can copy whatever it is here, you keep it outside the computer. Inside, sorry, outside it was a box, but it was floppy, which means it was flexible. But inside it was round like a disk. That's why they went diskette. Inside it was a disk. Then there was a part here which could read data from this, sorry, to read and write data on the diskette. But it was very sensitive to sensitive sensitive to sunlight, sensitive to heat, sensitive to humidity, sensitive to dust, and sometimes it could fit in the pocket. Sometimes you could forget that I have a disket in my pocket. You could sit on it, then you couldn't read any more information. But it worked a lot. Uh, the size of this device was 1.4 megabyte. It was very small. Nowadays, even one music it can fit in that diskette here but back in the days data was still in bytes it was not even in megabytes you could megabyte was a mega data you could have a lot of data there we could work with the kilobytes megabytes it was good enough to store a lot of information i remember i used this device a lot i even had a chance to use this type of computer which was excellent excellent abilities if you look at this computer it's very 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 good gives you a lot of talents especially with the keyboard because you don't have this device with a mouse i can even use a computer without a mouse nowadays but some of them if you some of you guys if you if i give you a computer without a mouse you can't start okay basically this is what uh, we have about the evolution of the computers the computer reached the home so those big companies research centers small companies medium companies they threw away those big machines and they opted for the small computer which could fit on a desk so the scientists they were very very happy that the computer managed to get home so let's go back to the objectives again of the scientists yeah reduce the size of the computer in 1981 they managed increase the speed of the processing they managed it in 1981 it had very good speed of processing take the computer home in 1981 the computer reached home improve the storage of the computer in 1981 they managed to do it substitute the technician in 1981 they managed to do it so it means if you just bought a computer in 1981 just get a manual or go to school you learn you can now use your own computer that thing of zero and one zero one it was left behind the computer with it could do that for you through software okay let's go back to our slide Okay, the fifth generation of computers in 1981 up to date. Uh, it means that um, it's a, there's a generation called the artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? This is a very big topic. It's a course. Only this word here. It's a course. Somebody can spend a year, two years just studying this or more studying this topic here. But I'm going to simplify it in very simple layman terms. Artificial intelligence, it means, in 1940, we talked about the ENIAC computer. Whoever thought in 2020, I could be putting a phone in my pocket. That's artificial intelligence. We don't know what's coming. And I'm thinking in 2020, my phone is very big. But you may find tomorrow or in 2022 or in 2050 you could get a very much smaller device but performing great things that's artificial intelligence back in the years 1940 they used to store data on punched cards now a punched card we're talking about uh, uh, it was actually a4 or a much bigger than that but storing very little data but nowadays we're talking about a memory card it's almost like this on this memory card we're talking about 30 gig or more which can be stored on this card even if you drop it you cannot even find it but it stores a lot of data but back in the years we had a magnetic tape very big 
small data. I remember the um, in the years there was a very big machine which could store data 5 megabytes. But looking at the size, just the size of a refrigerator, but you could store only 5 megabytes back in the years. But nowadays we are talking about 30 gig on a very small machine. And now we are talking about the cloud storage. We are even getting out of this memory card. We are now talking about cloud storage. Cloud storage, okay, everybody who uses, uh, for example, WhatsApp, you've got a Gmail account, which is, means you're going using Google Drive. You're storing your data on the cloud. You don't need a device. You just need a connection of internet. So that's what we call artificial intelligence. What comes after the cloud storage? Nobody knows. We're still waiting. The scientists, they still have these objectives. They haven't stopped these ones. They are still trying to work to reduce the size of the computer until now. They think that the types of computer we have nowadays in 2020, they're still big. They still have this objective of reducing the size of the computer. They still want to increase the size of processing. If you look at your phone, some of your phones, they are much faster than a personal computer. That's the objective of the, of the scientist. I can send information from Mozambique to the United States of America within seconds. I'm connecting and I'm talking like I'm talking to somebody who's outside. So that's the processing speed we're talking about. They're managing and they still want to fulfill that. Take the computer home. This one they managed. And they even managed to pass through the house. The phone is now in our pocket. The phone is now on our smart glasses, on our smart watches. The computer, sorry. So you see, that's what we call artificial intelligence. What comes after the smart glasses? What comes after the smart watch? What comes after the smartphone? Everything is going smart, 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 smart house, smart this, smart this. What's coming after that smart? So that's what we call artificial intelligence. Improve the storage of a computer. Like I was saying, they reduced from a punched card to a memory card now. From a memory card, they went on to cloud computing, cloud storage. What comes after cloud storage? That's artificial intelligence. Nobody knows. We're just waiting. And we're just going to be the consumers. Substitute the technician. Back in the 1940s or the first generation, second generation, third generation, only technicians could use the computers. But nowadays, look at yourself. Look at your phone, for example. You install alone, you install, you install alone applications. Let's look at this, uh, for example, WhatsApp. People can install alone. They can remove programs alone using Play Store. That's what they wanted. Substitute the technician. So it's an ordinary person who is not in IT, but he or she can install programs or remove programs from the computer. That's the objectives of the technician. Nowadays, the, even the program just facilitates you. Next, 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 finish. You're done. But a long time ago, back in the 2000s, back in the 90s, you couldn't even install a, a, a what do you call this one, a printer. You need a technician to do that for you. But nowadays, you can do that alone. Put a printer, buy a printer, just connect it on the computer. It's going to pick up automatically. So that's that was the objective, and that's still the objective of the technicians. An ordinary person being able to use any technology. So that's where we are going. So that was what we call artificial intelligence. So we are still waiting. The scientists are still working. We are only the consumers. We are going to be consuming. They're going to be working. I understand, okay, I've been in the area, in the computer IT areas. I started working with computers in 1999 up to now. We're talking about 20 years or so. But I understand there are other programs which are much uh, recent programs, which you guys you now dominate from A to Z. That's artificial intelligence. We're still waiting. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with me. 
uh, please subscribe on this channel so that you can receive uh, my lessons automatically on your device and uh, please give your like any comments any questions please just send me to you through the whatsapp group through the classroom we can communicate have a good day we continue in the next lesson